Welcome everyone, my name's Mark and I am here with a very exciting teardown. We've got a Microsoft Connect. Uh, and what has it done to offend me? Uh, nothing more than gather dust on my bookshelf. I was using it for some uh, some imaging a while back, but since then I've, I've come up with better ways of, of capturing things and it's probably just been sitting there for three, four years. It's, it's been a while. I'm not really even sure. So on the front of this thing, what we've got is uh, what appears to be a camera and then nothing. Now, I'm sure that there is something there. It's just probably uh, in the infrared and we can't see it. So just because something is optically opaque to us doesn't mean that it's optic optically opaque to uh, computers and sensors. So kind of interesting stuff. Um, should be fun. It also comes with a connector that I have never seen before or since. I can give you a little bit of a close-up of that, I think, uh, right here. Get a little better light on that for you. Come on. There we go. So this is kind of a bespoke cable, and it plugs into, uh, was it? Oh, it's this guy. So there's uh, an intermediate box that this thing interfaces with. You know, it plugs in, and then you've got a power input and a USB 3.0 interface, high-speed interface, and that is fed by this this wall plug doohickey. So, goes in like this, goes in like that, and then off to a full-size USB 3.0. Um, only reason I can think of that they did it this way was they needed a lot more power in it than the USB protocol can reliably provide um, or maybe could provide at the time. I'm not entirely sure which way the development of this product uh, went because I don't follow it. So we're going to set aside the power bricks and interfacing bricks for the time being and perhaps come back to those in a future teardown, but those will require a little bit more work. And we're going to focus our attention here on the Microsoft connect. Uh, two ways that we're going to get into this. There's nothing clear on the back. Uh, this is certain to be screwed together. It is possible that we need to pull out a heat gun and relieve, you know, pull off this, this hunk of glass on the front or plastic. It feels like plastic. Um, but it's far more likely that hidden, and you can even see them on the camera. I couldn't see those with my eyes. See hidden under here? We've got screw holes screw hole screw hole this is probably well, this might be a screw hole but more than likely it's just a a boss uh, from the, the plastic mold so let's let's get under there and get started all right I'm sure it helped that I just very thoroughly pinned these uh, stickers down what are you gonna do what are you gonna do Oh, that did not do what I wanted it to do. We just took the sticker apart. <laughs> Whoops. Well, I know where these things are, so if I know what the screw is, I can just poke through. Okay, it appears to be, and you can see this better on close-up, but it appears to be a security screw. Um, and you might not even be able to see make this out on close-up. Let's see. So there's a uh, a spline with a circle in the middle, apparently to keep people from taking things apart. Uh, <laughs> not me. No, 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 not me. So I've got actually that very screw right there, right here. And let's pull out a parts bin. Can't imagine I'm putting this back together, but just in case I do, I don't want parts floating all over the workbench. These are long. Full-length thermoplastic screws. Um, nothing real remarkable about them, other than it's a much longer engagement than I expected. And then I'm going to see if I can't find any other spots. There's one. I 
feel like there should be more. This would have been much easier had that plastic come off cleanly. Maybe I'll have a better chance on the other side. Maybe I should have used heat after all. I don't know. Okay, let's poke our screwdriver into those spots and see what happens. Uh, no engagement there. Got an engagement there. Much smaller, much smaller length screw, so that might be actually holding something uh, into the bottom of this case here, rather than keeping it closed. Another much smaller one. Wonder what's down that hole. I can't really tell. But we can see that the back's loose. So let's see if we have better luck on this side. Ah, there we go. That one came off cleanly. Oh, and check that out. They uh, do not want you removing that sticker. How clever is that? You can't even tell. I mean, if I was trying to surreptitiously take this thing off, I would use heat. Um, I wouldn't just yank on it, but you wouldn't even know that, that that information's there because it's black on black. That is strictly something to let people know that you've removed their sticker. And therefore voided your warranty. But we call this series Mark Voids a Warranty. I'm not going to get stopped by stickers. That ain't going to slow me down. I'll go put this thing on the table saw or the bandsaw if I have to. I don't care. I make bad choices. All right. So there's... The back is now free. Um, and nothing remarkable about this. It's just a piece of plastic. Um, hmm. Well, I guess there is something interesting. There's some reliefs on either side here. Put into it. In a couple different spots. It must be to get out of the way of these larger screw heads. But once we get through that, the security features appear to vanish. Right? These are just good old-fashioned heads. There's no security. It's the same size, so a technician doesn't have to change screwdrivers, which is nice. But there's nothing remarkable about them at all. So their security procedures appear to be using, uh, requiring a security bit, and then having those stickers that are designed to break away and let somebody know that you got into the thing. Again, if I was trying to do this surreptitiously, I would probably I would probably go for a heat gun and loosen up that adhesive. All right, so I'm trying to get the top off now so we can maybe get into this a little more. Feels like something is catching. Let's just keep taking things off. So right now I'm removing some side vents and Nothing spectacular about this. It's metal backed, probably for strength in case something hits it on the side. These fins would probably poke right through. So you've got a uh, just a slanted fin surface with a solid metal, well not a solid, but a perforated metal backing. And I'm guessing that backing is just for strength because without it, those pin, those fins might break away, you know, if a kid walks over and flicks them with their finger or something. I don't know. I am certain they had a good reason for it. And it feels like we're still engaged with something. So I'm going to keep looking for screws to take apart. One thing I like about this screwdriver, ah, oh, check that out. Isn't that, isn't that adorable? So I see a couple screws over here that are likely tying the back to the front. Come on. Or it might
might just be holding the front face on. I don't really know what these things do. Now, if they really wanted to give somebody a hard time from taking these things apart, what I would do, if I could, would be secret those screws away in something that's longer than your standard bit. Um, because you can buy these things anywhere. I mean, I've got another another something with this t end on it, except it's only this long. If you really wanted to make something hard to get into, make this thing, you know, this this long, this much longer. So you have to have a really long, narrow, special instrument to get into it. I mean, that would just be me. Because then you can still use off-the-shelf hardware and all it is is just designing a recess. Now we're still, I mean, we're pivoting. There we go. All right. So here is our first casualty of war. It look, what is holding that on? My goodness. Is it just all those little retaining clips? Must be. Yep, it is. So let's just do a little mark smash. And that front that we saw before, and I, you know, the only opaque, um, or I'm sorry, the entire thing's opaque except for this little, this little camera cut out. But if you look, there's holes in here, and these are all to let infrared stuff go through. I don't know if we can, as I shine this super bright LED in the back, you can see the infrared portion of the light makes it through, and this is a bright light, but only the IR portion of the emission is visible. So, I don't know if I need an IR filter for anything, but I don't know that I don't, so I'm not going to get rid of that anytime soon. And this is just a metal uh, piece. Uh, ostensibly, this is some sort of RF shielding. I can't imagine why they would include it otherwise. And they use something kind of clever uh, that I, I really haven't seen. This is really thin metal. I mean, this is a little thicker than a soda can. Well, it might even be the same thickness as a soda can, except it's made out of stainless. But instead of just grabbing it in one or two spots, there's all these little fingers that interact with the other side. That's why I couldn't peel it off earlier. So clever, clever toilet lever. And here is our look. We've got, um, this was would have been our visible camera before. This appears to be an IR emitter. And I'm guessing these three sensors are, I, I don't know why they're different sizes. But those are our infrared camera uh, sensors. They're pretty large, which probably adds a lot to the cost of this thing. This is just a, uh, a piece of uh, ferrite core that they're using for shielding. Interesting, interesting. Once we get it apart a little more, I will put things under the microscope and we'll see what else we can see. So we've got our first board and wouldn't you know it, the designers have used the exact same uh, the exact same screw head, which I can't, uh, this one isn't labeled. I, so I couldn't tell you if this is a tin or not, but I guess it doesn't really matter. You just grab the screwdriver that fits, huh? And again, all of these uh, have the pitch, the thread pitch to indicate that they're going into plastic. They're all in thermoplastic screws. Very popular when you've got plastic parts that you're screwing things into. Self-threading. They go right in. They hold strong. I would guess that you've probably got a dozen of these within of these screws hidden in products within five feet of you. Maybe not this exact size. When I say the screw, I'm talking about thermoplastic. Very common. All right. We are not ready to remove that. We might have some things plugged into it. 
There's more shielding. Again, I assume at this point it's all RF. And it would be nice to get that hinge out of the way, but I don't. Oh, right here. Oh, you guys changed, did it? Nope, they didn't. <laughs> it's all the same screw. This is so easy. So right now I am just going to remove this hinged foot because it'll make my life easier. Guess what kind of screws these are. If you guessed thermoplastic, you'd be right. What the heck is holding that in now, that little cable? Come on. Go forth and be free, little one. All right, now there is a FFC flat flexible cable that is holding that bottom on still. So we're going to get this little board out of the way so I can get to the connector and pop it. There we go. Little ferrite core that's covered in little ferrite core that's covered in foam, uh, probably just to keep it from rattling around. The foam has no other real purpose. And going down into here, uh, we've got a vented grill. So this has other electronics in here. Uh, if I had to guess right now without opening it up, I would guess speakers, but I am not sure just yet. That is a guess. And then friction hinges that hold this on. I mean, something else in here, you could have more IR circuitry. I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. Are we having fun yet? I don't know about you, but I know I am. Now we've got... I can't tell if it's the lighting. If those are brass or not. I'll know once I get them out. It's just awkward lighting in here. No, those aren't brass. They just looked at it first. And we're continuing to take things apart. That is an interesting um, perforation pattern. And I'll zoom in on that in just a second to show you. And when I say interesting perforation pattern, what I'm talking about is right here in front of this little black plastic fan shroud, there's this metal grating. And I assume that they designed it that way partially for airflow and partially to make it easier to expand. Um, less metal must be easier in the press to, to get that moved around. Otherwise, they could have potentially just gone for one or two slots and just let all the the air catch it in right there. All right, this thing wants to come apart. Uh, if I was a trained technician, I would know what it is that's hiding right now, and I'd bypass it. But since I'm not a trained technician, I might just have to play Mark Smash. Feels like there's some glue underneath this metal shroud. Interesting that it's all covered in stainless. These, this entire circuit board assembly is encapsulated in stainless. There are reasons to do that from an electromagnetic emission standpoint. And we're just doing Mark Smash right now. This is, of course, not an approved removal method. But what are you going to do? Oh, it just unplugged. Oh, that's interesting. That looks just like a USB 2. So how do we get that out? Let's get that little shroud out. It's smaller than a USB 2. Come on. There we go. That's what was holding it in. So I could have... 
I could have avoided all that damage if I had uh, yanked on this part really hard. Now, let me get back to my box. That looks smaller than a USB 3. I'm sorry, USB 3, but it is in fact a USB 3. So the entire part of this box must just be to increase the power because on one end we've got USB 3 and on the other end we've got that proprietary. But when that proprietary plugs into the connect, at that point you've got USB 3, USB 3. So this, maybe we won't take this apart if we ever have anything that needs a lot of USB power on a USB 3 you know, like maybe a hard disk drive adapter or something. I don't know. That might come in handy. Okay, metal shrouds are dead. Sorry, metal shrouds. So here we've got a fan. Uh, you don't really see four-wire fans that often, actually. So this is more than likely a stepper motor drive. Usually you'll see three where two are for power and one's a tachometer or something. Um, the only reason I can think that you would do a four position is to make this a stepper motor drive so you can control it, the speed exceedingly precisely, but then that doesn't give you feedback information. You know, maybe in a couple minutes we'll scope this um, and uh, see, see really how you drive this. Or we could just look at the data sheet. There's a part number on there. I can't see it, but maybe you can at home. There it is. Uh, DC brushless ASB 0405 LB. That is small. Is that a 5 volt 0.12 amp? So it could be those other two are sensor lines. Uh, I don't know. Maybe optical? Okay, that housing just popped right off. Isn't it funny how if you take things apart the right way, they just fall apart? It's just that so very seldom do I take things apart the right way. But we've got that now. Set that off to the side. Okay, we've got a couple cameras. We've got a board. And we've got a sensor and a... Oh man, there's a bunch of cooling stuff here. Okay, well, let's clean our area a bit. And let's continue the teardown. All right, so first thing we've taken off is this little board. Uh, looks like it's got an LED light on it and perhaps an optical sensor. We can look at that under the microscope in a moment. We'll set that aside, but the interesting stuff is here. So we took all the screws out of the bottom, and what we were doing when we did that was freeing it up for everything except for this connector. So what I'm looking at right now is this connector. And it's just a press fit, so I'm just going to release that. Oh, is there another one? Hiding under the foam? Is there? Is there? Looks like this F, there's an FFC into something over here. But... What does it do? Oh, it goes to the other side. They routed a big hole in there. Another press fit. Pops right off. Those are not designed to come on and off that many times in their lifetime. All right. So what we've done is disconnect this from what is essentially a large heat sink with some cooling fins in it. We've got another uh, few boards that is covered mostly in optical sensors. We can see what we can do to remove those. And, oh, our luck ran out. They changed, they changed tip sizes on us. It is not much of a problem though. This little set will open just about anything, and if it doesn't, I've got a few thousand outs out in the garage that will. I've got way too many of these. Just keep collecting them, I guess. And 
it's funny every time you buy a new set it's just to get that one that you don't need and when you do that you end up with duplicates and do you throw away the duplicates no they go into the junk drawer and then they go eventually you know you get around to sorting them and they go into the other drawer okay Arg. So right now I'm removing the camera sensor Z board, one of the optical boards, and dumping those screws. That'll be something fun to look at. And then we've got another camera. And all of these connections have machine threads on them. So we're just going through and yanking everything off. Even though we can't use the, uh, the boards without a great deal of engineering effort, the lenses can come in handy. For what, I couldn't tell you, but they do come in handy. You never know, you might see them on a future teardown from the looking through them from the other side. Okay, so just some thermal putty, not even all that carefully applied, connecting to this back heat sink. Same thing, oh, this is actually an interesting board. Okay, we're gonna wanna look at this one. This one, it's hidden, but it's the same design. There's a piece of metal laminated right to the board. So we're going to want to see how they did that. That could prove interesting. And these lenses, in another interesting little bit, but clever bit, these lenses do not appear to be adjustable in the least little bit. No set screw, no threads, nothing. So you've got to have very good manufacturing tolerances to be able to do that. To, um, and not for the lenses, but for the plastic housing and attachment to the board. Those things have to be placed within, I would assume, you know, about a tenth of a millimeter. Um, so that by the time you're done, every, you know, even the worst case, it's plus or minus two or three. And you can see this board, uh, this is the infrared board, it's got test points right on the end. That makes it super easy, since this particular board would be kind of hard to jig. I mean, you could do it, but it'd be kind of a pain. Uh, oh, there's more test points. I didn't see those until I looked at the camera there. But man, that's a sturdy board. So what you would do is you would drop this into a jig where you know, somebody's, um, a machine has cut out uh, a couple corners for it, you know, maybe here and maybe a, a hole, but something to hold it in in a good spot. And then, you know, you would come down with an overhead spring-loaded jig and you would hit all of your test points that you needed. But I'm guessing those are your test points and maybe those are programming points. I don't know. You always want to space them far apart if you can. You can get them down to about 50 mils on center before your um, jig costs go up a lot. But if you can go to, uh, you know, 100 mils on center, it makes life a lot easier. Okay, so there's a camera board to look at, and I, I do think that's gonna be interesting, but I wanna clean that off a tiny bit before we do something with it. Let's set it on this. This was the board we pulled off earlier. And then, this is the main logic board. And this is the heat sink. And it looks like it was created in two pieces. So we've got 
stainless fins that are, I don't know, 40 mils, 50, nah, I don't think they're 50. Let's call them 30 to 40 mils. And they're attached to what looks like I mean, I don't know if that's just because of the way they cleaned it, but it kind of looks like extruded aluminum that was machined afterwards. Yeah, I think that's what they did. So this is a piece of extruded aluminum angle, 90 degree, that, and this is a guess, but I think I'm right, that they took and then they milled everything that they needed into it. So I don't think this was, ooh, what's this? If that's aluminum, then I change my plan and say this was cast, but okay, that little wing now blows up my idea. See, if they had made this out of just 190 degree angle, I mean, you can buy that off the shelf and then you take it to your mill and you, you, uh, you know, you mill out the features that you want. You're going to have to mill features regardless of you cast it or, or whatnot, but, um, the thing that's making me change my mind is that little piece right there. Well, I suppose if if this whole thing was a little thicker than I thought, you know, maybe they made this at a 316 angle, I suppose they could have milled away the material. No, that doesn't make sense. They milled away the material on the bottom here. So where did that wing come from? All right, I changed my vote. I want to say this was probably cast aluminum then. So they made a mold that roughly had the right shape and then they went through and uh, took off the parts that they wanted and added other parts. Yep, there's another huge wing. So unless this was a big piece of T-angle, no, it can't be. It could be a, no, it can't even be Z. This was, this, this was cast and then milled. I just don't know why then they added stainless wings to it they could have done the milling there too it must have saved them money in the end because they could have just routed down the middle or even cut down the middle with a big saw i don't know but if you have to cool your stuff you got to cool your stuff this is when it pays to have a mechanical engineer with thermal experience or a good old-fashioned thermal engineer to be able to design your stuff the more gates, the more processing power you have, the more heat you generate. And you got to do something with that heat. Otherwise, it will destroy your boards. Something interesting about this board is it's a little heavier than I would expect, just holding it for its size. So it's a little denser than I would expect. That means heavy copper, baby. We'll look at this in great detail here in in just a sec. I'm going to take apart the first board that I looked at and then we'll do this one. Okay. Let's start with this board. This little guy. And I'm going to flip over to uh, Mr. Scope. For those of you who have never seen Mr. Scope, this is him. He's happy. And he's got a camera on the top. So it'll take me just a second to get this sort it out. I hope you'll bear with me. We also might be joined by Mr. Chester here in just a second. He's the shop cat, one of the shop cats. He's a good boy. Okay, let's see which direction and whatnot we need to go. Looks like I need to focus down. All right, we are under heavy mag magnification, and if I, I might have to pull out an XY stage because stuff moves so abruptly here. So this little guy is an LED, and you can see the bond wires underneath there that are connecting the different substrates. It's not the cleanest LED I've ever seen, um, but that could be because I'm the one that dirtied it up. Sorry about that. Let's not uh, hold Microsoft responsible for that. And the other part that I think is an optical sensor is on the other. Oh, there's a little baby resistor. Hi, resistor. 
I am looking for this. So this does appear to be some sort of a photocell or a photoresistor. Interesting. Each one of those, I believe, each one of those little long rectangles that we see inside is um, is meant to absorb energy and convert it into a voltage that then gets sucked off the top. So I believe this is a little baby photovoltaic cell, essentially. Um, if you have other ideas on what this is or know more about it than I do, which is likely, leave a comment in below or in chat if anybody's interested. All right. What shall we look at next? How about this guy? So right now I've got this big board and we are going to get it under the scope, get zoomed out a little and uh, see what there is to see. These are great little scopes. They are inexpensive. Um, easy to use. The only thing I don't like is that you lose focus with zoom, but I mean if that's my only complaint, I don't have much to complain about, yeah? All right. That doesn't look very uh, that bad visually. But I do see some things right away. Uh, for example, uh, and I just happened to zoom here, this little sliver right there of copper is something that could be eliminated without reducing the strength of the thing, of, of the, um, what am I saying? Not the strength, but without reducing your, sig your ground significantly at all. All that little thing can do is act as an antenna at extremely high frequencies, which I doubt is very likely on this board. I don't really know how big that feature is, but more than likely is it can tear off during manufacture and kind of float around and hit another piece of the board. Another thing of note, look where these drills are. Drills wander. They do not always hit the center of a hole. A um, lot of reasons why, but if you think about it, you know, we're talking about mills. That drill is off by, you know, maybe one and a half mills. It's not much, eh, maybe two, I don't know. I, I don't really know our scale, so it's hard to really give a, a proper guess. But if you look how this thing has come down almost to the point of breakout, if this had wandered into the, in the direction of the trace, it would have significantly decreased the amount of copper near the trace, maybe even breaking the trace. So it's always a good idea to fillet or dog bone your, or I'm sorry, keyhole your, your vias so that if the drill does wander in the direction of the trace, there's still gonna be plenty of copper around. So I just happened to notice that. Not, not the worst thing in the world. But if you could eliminate that copper from the copper pour and eliminate the, uh, or not eliminate, but add a, a keyhole or a fillet, that would be a good thing to do. It does look like they used extensive copper pours, but something I don't see with all of these copper pours are vias tying that copper to anything. That big piece of floating copper is an antenna. You want to always tie those, you know, at least every hundred mils. Um, they, I, I don't know what frequencies they're doing. Sometimes I'll do fifties. It kind of pisses off the drill operators, but it's, I mean, all they do is just give me a dirty look. They still do it. Here you can see they've tied it. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but look at that. You can see the fiberglass. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of epoxy in those areas. The fiberglass is poking through. This is a fiducial. This is used to locate the, the board in a machine. I do not know what these random through hole vias are for. 
undoubtedly some connections on some other layers, maybe even on the whole other side. I do like that they did copper pores everywhere. That's a good thing. Um, it helps the, uh, the etching process so that you get even etching over your board. It helps to keep your board from warping during reflow. But there's a little bit of uh, measling in every drill hole. Interesting. So here, I'm guessing we've got an inductor there. Some microcontroller, nothing too fancy here. You can see that they did some, uh, I'm guessing those are caps. So they've got decoupling caps, you know, relatively close. They could have pushed them in a little bit, but it wouldn't have made much difference. They're, they're pretty close. And some, I'm guessing some bulk caps a little further out. The ground ties are a little long. Um, well, at least on the left. So what you're trying to do with these capacitors isn't necessarily provide capacitance. I know that's amazing, but it's true. You, you, you're not actually trying to um, dump energy in your, well, you are. But really what you're, the goal of these things is, is to decrease inductance. So every time that logic gates on this board switch, you get this phenomenon called ground bounce. See in here, there's this silicone die and the die has these bond wires that tie it to the lead frame and the lead frame connects out here and then we solder it and then it goes out here and then it goes out here and then it goes to you know ground and then it goes all the way back inside and it comes up again. So you got this huge loop you actually want to minimize that loop, if at all possible. So s give it a return path. Um, see how there's like a, a, a via here? I, I don't know if that is tied to anything else or, or what it is, but these guys, I would bet money, are what they tied their ground returns to. But that creates a big loop. So if you can, and oftentimes, oh, maybe I'm wrong. What's going on under here? I don't know. Anyways. Uh, the lesson still stands. Anytime that you can pop a via, uh, a via in, you know, right, move this capacitor up a couple millimeters so that it's closer. I mean, you could, we could easily do that, and then drop the return vias um, right then and there, so we can decrease the inductance. That wouldn't be a bad thing. Now, obviously, this board worked, so what they did was just fine. But I'm just pointing it out. The faster the switching, the more important that becomes. All right, so here are a couple of vias with interesting design choices. Let me see if I can. This one here on the, so I'm looking at this via and this via. Of the two vias, the via on the left, I like the best. See how the drill almost wandered um, out of the via? I mean, it's very close to breaching the via wall. Well, if that had wandered in the direction of this trace, this one would still be okay. This one would not. So when you hopscotch the vias here, if this drill had wandered towards this trace here, it would have broken it. You never really know which direction it's going to wander or, or go off, off kilter. So the one on the left, the drill could have wandered in any direction. The drill could have broken out and the board would still be fine. Here, there are two directions, you know, at about, I don't know, let's call that 45 degrees in this direction and um, 215 degrees down here. So there's two places that this drill could have wandered that would have destroyed this net. There is no place that this drill could have wandered to destroy that net. Does that make sense? Again, the board worked, but in this case, it was luck. Here, the board worked because the design was good. It was fine, right? I'm just being nitpicky. That could have destroyed the board, you know, or at least destroyed that net. Now, here's something else that's interesting, and I don't quite understand. This was, a, uh, in my opinion, it, it looks like a mistake. 
This net goes nowhere. It all I can't tell if that is a cavity underneath and this was a via that they may I can't imagine that's a via. It looks like they forgot to put the via pad or they pulled the via pad off for some reason. Now maybe maybe that's electrically sound, I don't know, but something happened here that was wrong. Here we've got a via that goes, you know, apparently nowhere, but that could just be a through hole via connecting some other layers and we just don't see it. And we've got some unused pads here. Maybe some capacitance we don't need. All right, so this is interesting. I, I don't really know what this circuit is, but just a weird way to connect those traces. Um, again, you've got a via in a spot where it could wander in three directions and kill part of the net. If they had moved the via off to the side a little and brought all the three traces in separately, the via could wander in any direction and not kill the net. Another good thing there, teardrops. And we're just wandering around. Some unfilled, unpopulated parts. I don't know, you see interesting thing. Looks like we've got some detrius there. That can create a short. You don't want that floating around. It is almost as though different, well, I'm sure they did, but different designers did different parts of the board. Here, you can see these guys put vias to close that inductive loop as quickly as possible. We didn't see that on the other design. I still would say, I personally would have moved these a little closer. Um, I don't know that we need the caps out that far. And then if you look at our pull-up resistors, they used multiple vias. And this is an excellent strategy because you never know when a via is going to fail, uh, especially on a board that gets very hot. Over time, the uh, differential coefficients of thermal expansion will, will break the via, the via barrels. And if you have more than one via, the chances of that happening go down. We're just cruising around. Looks like we've got a board with some schmutz on it. Could have been cleaned a little better. And I'm just looking for interesting things. So we see some differential pairs that came out and they dropped them down into the board immediately. And they also did something else that's interesting that a lot of designers forget to do. They put some ground return vias on either right next to the differential pairs. Would it have been better if they were a little closer? Sure, but they're close enough. How do we know this? Well, this is a functioning connect that I took apart. But if you have those ground return vias, they can decrease your electromagnetic return. Um, you always need to have a return path and engineers that know this usually remember the return paths on adjacent planes, but a lot of them will forget that you need a vertical return path as well as you change layers. And you can see this differential pair, same thing. They put in a ground return. And in fact, if you look around, it looks like they this could okay so whoever did this part of the board's a little more clever than the others because they did ground returns on everything and you really should i mean if if you know that you need a re, to route a return path um you got to remember to do it vertically as well and these guys did okay there's another one of those stubs another three stubs so these are vias but these are not well-made vias. See how there's a annular ring around all of these? There's not here. This should have been caught in DFM. Huh. 
And these are teardropped. The other ones weren't. Interesting. So the only reason I can think that you would teardrop part of a board and not the other is maybe you're bringing in components from different designs, uh, designers with different software setups, but you'd think um, the chief engineer would have caught that. Whoever the engineer of record is. Okay, so we've just got differential pairs doing something, some length matching there. And I'm not looking for anything in particular. I'm just looking around the board for things that there's one of the another st another stub. I mean, granted, it's an unpopulated part, but there is a via there with an incredibly small hole. Um, I'm surprised the manufacturer didn't kick it back to them, to be honest with you. We would have and at least said, did you really mean to do this? We would have manufactured it anyway but we would have asked him about it. Nothing all that interesting. This was one of the uh, one of the connectors that I popped off earlier connecting the boards and you can see it's just diff pair after diff pair after diff pair. Uh, this was to one of the... was this the main one to the front or was this to the camera module? I think this might have been to the front panel. I don't really remember. Things look different under the microscope. And we're looking. We're looking. Everywhere there's a via hole, everywhere there's a drill hole. When this thing went in the press, when these boards got put together, there was a spot to squeeze epoxy out and the epoxy went into the no that's not right why are we seeing that because we would have drilled after we laminated I will ask my friend Elijah because we're seeing that all over the place uh, another was that no that's just a hole Just some transistors, nothing of note here. Let's see if there's anything else. If not, we'll move on and start looking at the interesting stuff. There's a LED. That one looks a little cleaner, a little easier to see. Let's see if we can't zoom in on that for a second. All right, enhance. Come on. Oh, don't be that way. The, um, there we go. Nope, a little higher. At these zoom levels, the uh, the focus is incredibly tight. So now I gotta see if I can find that part again, and I think I might be able to. Maybe there it is. So this is a cleaner LED. Um, you can see the two bond wires there on a white background, white substrate. That's a clean looking one. But other than that, I don't know if there's anything. Well, we can look at the backside. That might be fun. That's a clean picture of something for somebody. Just looking around, we see over here on the left some more vias. And remember what I told you, teardrop that stuff if ever you can in case you get breakout. We got a lot of via connections connecting that little piece of copper. We have an angry kitty. Excuse me for one moment. Come here, big guy. There you go. If 
Like you can hear him. Chester says hi. He also wants fish. That's his I want food. He has food. He just wants more food. What's going on here? I am looking at the via, or not the via, but the uh, solder ball on the left. Where is my cursor? I'm looking right there, and why is there a cavity in it? Nope, I just collapsed it. I. It's just hollow. Interesting. There's another one with a hole in it. So you oftentimes get contaminants in um, in this stuff, and sometimes they will leave a void, or even the flux will leave a void. But if you have prop proper heating and cooling, those voids aren't usually a problem. Um, and in fact, I don't know why we have one here. I already destroyed the other one to no effect. Let's see if we can zoom in anymore. Not easily. Oh, this is going to be fun. All right, viewers, you'll excuse me for a second, but my curiosity calls. I must know. But now the question is, are we ever going to find that again? Maybe we'll find another one, another something interesting. Oh, there's some tiny, tiny vias again. So the tiniest mechanical drill that you can make is 5.9 mils. After that, you've got to switch over to UV laser drilling. I was looking for one of those um, voided solder balls, but things are just too movable on my bench. Um, I don't have the rigidity I needed to stay in position during zoom. Oh well. All right, let's set that aside and move on to another board. I think we've seen everything there is that interests me there. So here we've got, and I'm going to zoom out here, give you a bit of a better view, hopefully. Here we've got the LCD screens, uh, not LCD, but um, are these CMOS? It's certainly not LCD. That was just a misspeak. But we've got the sensor elements. And I am searching desperately for focus. And I'll tell you this, it's being mean to me. And I think I'm focusing on the top glass that I've smudged with my smudgy hands. Let's try zooming out. I have angered the gods of focus. And I must pay. This would be a good spot to trim out. Okay, so there's our element. And if I want it to be bigger, I need to go further away. If I want it to be bigger, I need to go even further away. Let's kill some of these ancillary lights and see if we can't get oblique lighting going. See if that does it any good for us. Nope, that glass is just creating a 
a huge clear. You guys might even be able to see better than I can. But I can't really see what's going on under that glass just yet. So let's go back to what we had and see if we can't get to those elements. Oh, I know why. Okay, let's get back to an overhead view here. So here's what's going wrong. I am looking at lenses. I'm not looking at elements. These things all have some sort of a magnification chamber behind them. So that might be why I'm having trouble seeing them visually. There's more focusing going on than I knew about. Well, let's end that, huh? We need a security bit. So what I'm looking at now is taking out those screws and I set that little tool aside a moment or two ago when I switched to getting something that I could uh, point with. So let's take this more apart. Hopefully I don't have to uh, desolder anything. This might also explain why those sensor elements seem so big. Bigger than most. does not that does not appear to want to come off it might want to be desoldered first I'm not entirely sure let's get under it with a bit of a pry force and see if we can't make some forward progress without breaking out the soldering irons. So all I'm doing now is playing Mark Smash. I'm not even worrying about it anymore. Mark smash. That should free that piece of glass that's schmutzed. Get that out of here. Come on. You know, I never understood why electronics fight me when I take them apart. I'm always going to win. You'd think they'd know that by now and stop putting up such a fight. All they're doing is delaying the inevitable. And as the saying goes, resistance is futile. All right, so this was a piece of dicoric glass. That's one of the reasons, and I've got really weird lighting in this setup, but that's one of the reasons that um, things were looking a little weird to me. So dicoric glass, I don't know if I can demonstrate this with this light. It might be too bright. I believe it's too bright. But dicoric glass only allows certain wavelengths through while blocking others. It's kind of like a, a bandpass filter. So you look at it one way and it's one color and you look at the reflected light and it's another. And I don't know if I can demonstrate that. All of my lights are overwhelming the sensors. See on the left, okay, so this is the glass. On the left side, you can see purple colors pass through and you can kind of see yellow colors reflected. I need better lighting in here. So we're allowing the purples to pass through and 
blocking the yellows. This is not, of course, a white light source, which is part of the problem. We need an incandescent to properly illustrate it, but... And hidden underneath the dichroic glass, we've got almost what looks like sensors, but I can't believe that they are. Let's see. Let's get something with a little different head on it. Let's try this. Oh, this sound cannot be good. It's coming apart, though. Looks like they're almost got it. So I did need to desolder those four metal posts to remove it properly. Probably should have just done that, but okay. So here's what looked weird. So I couldn't really tell what those elements were. Um, and here's why. This is the covering for the screen. And it's all these little lenses, almost like a Fresnel or something. And I was viewing the sensors through that lens. Right? So each one of these is going to feed a sensor. And each one of these um, has all sorts of these little rectangular elements in there that it's possible it's a Fresnel lens. But here are the actual sensors. See how small those little puppies are? All right, things are starting to make a lot more sense now. I was wondering why they used sensing elements that were so huge. It just didn't make any financial sense. And the answer is, they did not. This bad boy, if we can ever focus on it, I'm not seeing. It's tiny. I can, I'm getting glimpses of it, but let's see if we can, can we focus it all and improve it? That little thing in the middle appears to be our sensor element for each of these guys. Tiny, tiny, tiny. That makes a bunch more sense. See, you can only fit so many, um, you can only fit so many circuits on a given silicone wafer. And the more things that you fit on there, the more profitable your design's gonna be. So we've got a little more RF shielding to get through. And then we can start taking a look. It does look like some desoldering is in order to really get to the heart of this, but let me see if I can avoid that with a pair of shears. I'm going to get my microscope out of the way for a moment. Ow, that wasn't smart. So this RF shielding really does desolder. Uh, I'm just being lazy. So hidden underneath um, that RF shielding is, haha, even more RF shielding. <laughs> So what did I accomplish there? <laughs> I don't know. Let's 
still saying, desolder me, desolder me. Don't rip me off the board. Okay, now we know more what's going on. These are not sensors at all. I was wrong. These are laser diode drivers. And that laser diode driver hits this diffraction grating. That would make a lot more sense than what I was thinking before. Laser diode driver hits diffraction grating and it's going to spread out a light pattern. And each one of these is going to produce a slightly different light pattern. So if you cycle through these three laser diode drivers and three different light patterns, you can generate points that you can then see with your camera modules. So these guys are infrared laser diode drivers, diffracts out, creates a pattern that is random yet predictable. And then we've got an infrared camera that is off to the side that can watch those dots move around. And as they move around, it'll know what, uh, what distance will cause a specific point to show up at uh, a specific pixel on the sensor. So that makes a lot more sense. Okay. That's kind of the fun of taking things apart. You figure out how they work. Uh, you make guesses. <laughs> Often I'm wrong. But um, you get to learn about things. And that's the fun part. So I don't even care that I was wrong. I didn't study this before I took it apart. But I know looking at it that this big piece of metal is a big heat sink. And I know looking at it, because I've played with them before, that this, it's not going to come out. It's pressed in there. Or no, it's epoxied in. That this little three terminal is a laser diode. Ah, the mo wonders of modern electronics. And we've got some, this board has its own set of bulk capacitors to provide a regulated power output. It actually looks like there's a uh, inductor. So this must be part of a, a switcher, a switch mode power supply that is then regulating and providing power to those lasers. How about that? And while we're here, we might as well look at the control circuitry for each of those lasers, because they appear to be identical. I wish there was there a way to tighten that up a little. I don't know. I'll have to play with that off camera. So underneath Mr. Microscope, and we certainly can zoom out here and focus down. But underneath our thing, we've got a, uh, an IC for each laser. Really looks like they could have cleaned these boards, but maybe they weren't allowed to for whatever reason. There's schmutz and flux all over these. Just because you have no clean flux doesn't mean you have a no clean board. Um, however, there are certain components that do not tolerate the cleaning process. I mean, there's a few things I would have done a little differently. Um, over on the left-hand side here, let me get my orientation. You've got three pins, uh, probably ground pins. Uh, they could be power pins. I, I don't really know. That are all tied together with a single via. I would have preferred to see those things tied together with the via out to the side it's because Right here, you've got three directions that drill can wander that will kill your net and destroy your board. It reduces your yield. And you never know which direction that drill is going to wander. Nothing, well, there's another time, you know, 
same board, you can see that the drills wandered in a different direction. Right? If we go back here, uh, oh gosh, where were we? This is the furthest diode driver. You can see the drills mostly on centered, but it's wandered a little up. Mostly on center, but it's wandered a little left, and it, I mean, it's almost killed that connection to that middle, to that middle trace there, right? It's not that far off. It's half a mil, a mil from destroying that. And the third time, you know, we're mostly centered, a um, little down into the left. So remember that those things, the drills are going to wander and design around it if you can. You want to make it so that there's no one direction the drill can wander and kill your board. A couple length matched pairs. Nothing too exciting here. They did use plenty of um, tie points throughout their ground pours. You like to see that. It keeps you from creating a piece of copper that can act as an antenna. Here you see a field of vias that are connecting other layers. I mean, they just, it's much cheaper to do a through hole than a blind or a buried via. So they did that. They just had them poke through to the other side. And, uh, you know, somewhere on the other side of this board, there's a bunch of connections doing something. What? I don't know. This looks to be where they are. So they're just tying up probably in this case a power plane um, of some sort. I've got one last IC over here, if I can locate it. Am I too far over? Okay. Um, all right, so see how this designer tied these pins together. The other one used traces. This one used a ground pour. Ground pour would be preferable so that if you do have a via that wanders, you know, like this one, this is, I mean, almost identical to our previous situation, except this designer did a better job. This via can wander in any direction it wants. It's not going to affect the ground connection to these three pins. That's what you want to design to, because then you'll have a higher yield when you're making a hundred thousand or a million of these things like Microsoft did. You don't want some stupid via or trace to ruin your board. Here's another spot. These traces are thin. I don't know if there's a reason for them to be that thin. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of manufacturing variability. Um, sometimes, like here, I don't know if that was a design decision or a manufacturing flaw. Sometimes things etch a little more in some spots and etch a little less in another. Here you can see that we've got an even different designer um, because this designer put in a keyhole. See that little extra bit of copper so that if this thing wandered down it would hopefully not break out. The only thing is you'd like to see that keyhole a little bigger. A um, little bigger so that if you do wander you don't lose it. Okay so these are design choices. That last thing we saw wasn't a manufacturing flaw. This is this designer next down is traces. Another good design practice. Only other, f I mean, I really don't have much to say other than I would make those traces a little bigger if possible. Um, I probably would have connected this trace over to this trace and not included that part. Um, that's a personal design choice. Another via that's, you know, almost broken out, but it's a thick enough trace, it doesn't really matter. See, okay, so this is probably our clearest keyhole yet, um, except you want that keyhole to be bigger, uh, to be th wider, thicker, so that if the via does come down there into that area, there's still going to be one or two mils of copper on either side, if you can, right? Engineering is the art of compromise. Little scanning code. Interestingly, around the vias here, we don't see that. We don't see the fiberglass coming up. 
Oh man, that's a lot of schmutz. Ew. And more schmutz. So, let's get back to see if there's anything we missed. Um, I've got one more camera board that we can take a look at. That's this guy. He's got a dirty bottom, so I've got him sitting on a piece of plastic here. Let's get this one under the microscope and see if there's anything worth looking at. I mean, this is a clean looking board so far. It's kind of hard to see. Um, looks like they've got a dark green solder mask on a green prepreg. So if I'm having trouble seeing traces, you can imagine what the AOI, I mean, they, well, they do better than that, but Having these dark on dark colors, unless you've got a good reason for it, does it make a cool looking board and a clean looking board? Heck yes, it does. But it's a nightmare when it comes to inspection. It, it just increases the operator fatigue. Uh, machines can make more mistakes. You can't really see what's going on. I do see some things though, and I like this. Um, this is something I do. You see how they have gone overboard with vias like every I really don't know our scale right now um, let's call them every 25 mils eh, that's probably wrong but let's just say that it's right so you set up in your software and you just create an array and you drop it down and everywhere there's a violation you delete it if that makes any sense um, so you create your design, you create your copper pores, and at the end, you create an array of vias all tied to whatever um, whatever net you want to tie them to. Um, you drop them down, and if there's no interferences, you change their net to be that via, and you do it in mass, by the way. You don't do these individually. It'd take forever. And if there's a violation, like there's a component there, you just delete it. And what you get then is a very tightly controlled EMI. Um, you, do, you, you barely get any electromagnetic interference. Oh, man, this is a nice looking board. The guy who made this has style. I'll give him that. We've got thin copper features. Oh man, he ran vias in the traces. Oh wow, I wouldn't have done that but he got away with it. These are tiny, tiny drills. And I wish I, maybe I can do oblique lighting for you. Would that be an improvement? Let's try that. I mean, it's a little better. You get a little more. So this crazy guy has vias okay I don't know I'm trying to find a locator for you he's tying to vertical vias on another layer that you can kind of make out underneath see how we jumped from here this bottom via to this top one and from this bottom via to this top one so he's made right angle interfaces but man, those are impossibly small vias. Those would probably have to definitely be laser drilled vias. Uh, and that increases the cost. He, he got away with it. Um, it's just an expensive way to do things. Um, but he, he's got a, a clean looking board. Uh, my guess is that was the only option to, to keep this a two layer board and keep it within the size that he was allowed. but it's really hard to demonstrate features because of the color choices, which is a dark green solder mask on a green prepreg. We would have been better off if he'd gone, say, a black prepreg 
uh, and or black core with a white solder mask or you know green is regular green is the color of choice but the interesting thing the thing I like about this board um, and it's not something that I've seen in production too often and that is that they have metal laminated straight straight to the stack here Let's see if we can separate it oh, that's going to be a thin board baby let's not go to the ER today so I I don't know how this is secured but I'm trying to get that piece of metal off looks like it might just be glued on not truly laminated might even be soldered on for all I know oh this is a neat board I hate to do this but I need to show you how thin this is this board is thin I'll see if I can uh, if I can get it loose here without putting this knife into my hand um, we will find out exactly how thin oh come on don't be that way looks like it's gonna just break off which is fine we're not putting this back together so boards are 0.8, 1.6, or 2.4 millimeters thick. This board is very, very thin. Let's see if we can get something on screen here. Oh, light would help. Now focus. Oh, I need like an automatic focus rig. That would be cool. All right. So again, most boards are 0 0.8, 1.6, or 2.4 millimeters thick. That, those are industry standards. This thing is much thinner than that. Let's see. I have got calipers handy. So it looks to be in the neighborhood of 15 mils, which is 0.4 millimeters. That is a thin board. And it has its own issues. Uh, it becomes a, an issue to put this thing in the machine and route it because the machines just destroy it. So you have to come up with special jigging. It's something that we do every day but it's not something that you want to do because it requires expert operators and more time more time means more money to you the designer so if this board could have been thicker for some you know I, I don't know what the design requirements that made it this thin are especially with that honking piece of aluminum on the back maybe that's what did it um, but if they could have made this board twice as thick, it would have cost half as much. And here we've got an edge view. And my apologies for the movement. It's about as good a focus as I can give you. Sorry. But we've got an edge view of the core and you can see the weave and then there's copper on either side kind of interesting in its own right I mean you can barely make out the weave patterns and you can see the copper 
on the edge of these things because, well, I ripped it apart. But isn't that clever? All right. Well, it seems like I have thoroughly destroyed Microsoft's Connect, uh, especially after you start ripping boards in half. It's kind of hard to put them back together. I'm not going to lie. You see that stuff on TV, you know, they give you a laptop that's been blown up and the, the motherboard's in half. And they're like, oh, we can fix it. No, you can't fix that. That's not fixable. But that is interesting. I learned what these really are versus what I initially thought they were. Remember, I thought those were CCDs. They're not. They're diffraction gratings. The light goes through. It creates patterns, which I would probably need a laser to demonstrate. Uh, it creates patterns. The laser itself is going to have a little bit of, of um, randomness to it, and this will just spread it out. So given the three laser diodes shooting out their patterns, the cameras can come back behind there and look at those patterns and see how they change. And as the distance between the dots increases and decreases, you can see the... Um, you can tell that the object is either moving towards you or away from you. So, oh, guess what? I was wrong. These things are adjustable. Ha ha ha! It's just there was... They were glued all the way down to where you couldn't see the screws. Okay, that makes more sense. I've never seen a lens that isn't adjustable. So, man, I'm learning all sorts of stuff today. So we've got what appears to be an IR filter on the back there because I can't see through it. And then we've got a focusing element on the front. So, hmm. Put that in our little bag of tricks. All right, folks. Well, I hope you found this fun on a Friday afternoon. Um, I always like voiding warranties and learning what I can learn. And, you know, sometimes you pick something up. Sometimes you find something somebody else could do better. And we found a few of those things as we went through this. So it's been a fun hour and a half. Um, I hope you'll come find me on more Teardown Tuesdays or Fridays or whenever we do them. But let me know if you have some stuff you want to want me to tear apart or critique. Send me a board. I'll, I'll tell you what I like about it, what I don't. Won't mean much, but you'll know how Mark feels. That's always a plus, right? No. Um, if you have any needs, if you ever need a board made, if you need a free DFM or a free DFA, a design for manufacture, design for assembly, we're happy to do it. Just email sales at aapcb.com. And... Uh, I guess we should logo it there. And if you ever have any projects, any special projects, we, we do all sorts of stuff. We've got boards in space. We've got boards down deep holes, boards in cars. I mean, it, it's hard to find an area of electronics engineering that we don't touch in some way. So just reach out. We're happy to help. If you want a free webinar for your team, um, you know, we do all our engineering services. We, we do for free. It's just a value add if you come work with us. So come check out Advanced Assembly. My name's Mark. I am in the uh, research and sometimes the marketing department. It just kind of depends on the day. But reach out. It'd be good to get to know you. Thanks so much. Have a good day. And bye.